Before we start, we would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land we're recording on. For me, that's the Wangaburra clan. And for me, it's the Wurundjeri peoples. Hello, welcome to us. We're two girls, one pod. Or are we? I don't know. Or are we? <laughs> Lovely. Hello, everybody. We're back. Two Girls, One Pod, Angeli and Evie. <laughs> and we have a really exciting episode this week because we have a guest. We've got our very first guest too. And this is a guest to have. Oh, she is divine. I've said it once. I've said it a thousand times. I love me some Georgia Grace. I've got a massive girl crush on her. I think she's divine. She's smart. She's beautiful. She knows about sex. What more can you want in life, truly? And she's so nice. She's pretty. And I think after this episode, you're all going to have huge girl crushes on her. Um, Boy crushes, girl crushes, all the crushes. You've met her before. For Angie Tries It, is this correct? Yes, this is correct. We did a whole entire episode together where I got to talk about my queer side, about my religious Catholic guilt with sex. We talked all the things. Go back and listen to that if you see fish. Yeah, go back and listen to it if you like and then listen to this episode. Um, Follow her on Instagram. She's a wealth of knowledge and she's such a kind person and she holds a very safe space for you she while does. she's educating you. So uh, without further ado, here she is. Welcome back. Thank you. It's so good to see you both again. As you know, I have a lot of chronic illnesses <clears throat> and a lot of people that follow me on my Instagrams also are suffering in silence mostly. So I haven't started the whole sexual side of things things yet because I'm still healing. But it is something that I'm going to have to get back into, right? Obviously, I'm starting to get the urges again, but I am so petrified with having endometriosis, adenomyosis, interstitial cystitis. Oh God, there's more. Oh, the list goes on. So I'm very sore, doit, in all, and not in a good way. That sounds like I'm, it's like sexy, but it's not. No. Being tight isn't sexy. It's painful. And what? how do I get myself back into that? Yeah. So I see this all the time with my work and I do work a lot with vaginismus, which often for people who have endo may also have vaginismus. So it is essentially a psychological fear of pain that manifests into um physical pain and oh even, uh, you know, the tightening or the, the shutting of the vaginal canal. So um, it can be really, really painful to have sex. And I think any time you're experiencing pain during sex or experiencing pain in your genitals, in your stomach, in an area that we typically associate with sexual pleasure, of course you're not going to want to engage with it because it's scary. No one wants to be in pain. And here we are, of course, talking about unwanted pain because, yes, some people do explore and enjoy pain yeah. during sex, but when it is consensual and when they're, you know, wanting to engage with that. So often people will identify that they have these urges, as you put it, Angie, um, in that you are desiring sex, maybe you're wanting it, it's a part of who you are as a person, it's a part of your identity and it's exciting for you, but the fear of pain is getting in the way between you and um, exploring that. And there are so many things that you can do. Um, There are incredible practitioners out there. I often work alongside pelvic physios um, who, yeah, I know that you're going to be seeing one soon, Angie, um, as well as psychologists, depending on the condition and depending on what your body is currently experiencing. But I think one of the first steps is to break this fear pain cycle and to create a sense of safety for your body. And I think this space of safety is foundational for all people to relax and to release into pleasure. 
Mm. So in session, we will essentially look at what are all the things that you need to do to feel safe in your body or safe during sex with someone else. And what are all the things that you need to do to feel like you have a sense of control. And we may work on verbal and nonverbal ways to communicate this so that, you know, going into a sexual experience, you have some tools at the ready to um, make sure that if pain comes up, that you can manage pause, stop, slow down, redefine sex so that you're not just having penetrative sex because often penetrative sex is the most uncomfortable thing for people. Um, So, yeah, finding different ways to manage it to make sure that sex is really pleasurable. But chronic illness and chronic pain, of course you're not going to want to engage with that. And I think a lot of my clients come to me and they're like, I don't know why I'm not wanting sex. I don't know why I'm Mm -hmm. not desiring sex or it's affecting my sex life with my partner and when we reflect it back and look at all of the reasons that they may not be engaging with it they're like oh of course that makes sense it's hurting me <laughs> like why yeah. would I want to do that yeah so it's, it's almost like the fear of the unknown so it, it's if you create like a safe space around it and have that communication then maybe that fear in your mind it won't be as frightening when you come to do it Absolutely. Yeah. So it it really, really depends on the condition and it depends on what um, you're currently um, living with. But say, for example, vaginismus being a psychological fear of pain, it's Mm. just because it's a psychological fear of pain, it doesn't mean that it's very real. Like it is a very real pain in your body. Um, But what we would do is we'd look at different ways that um, the individual can limit that fear of pain. And one approach that I like to use is education through masturbation. So Mm. finding different ways that they can bring pleasure into the experience. A lot of what a pelvic physio might do is working with dilators, um, massage and touch, and that's really great and really important. And I kind of parallel that work by um, teaching my clients how to touch their body and how to create safety and pleasure for their body during a masturbation practice. And one of the first steps is you know, masturbation to build arousal in their body, to touch their bodies in a way that actually feels pleasurable. That may just be external stimulation to start with. And that's Mm. great. A lot of people with vulvas will only climax from external stimulation of the clitoris. So taking that time to build arousal. And then it's kind of like this start-stop method. Once there's arousal in their body, they may bring a hand just to their vulva externally mm. and thinking, oh, okay, like that that doesn't feel painful or that feels actually yeah. quite comfortable. And then you'll move away and then you'll bring your hand back. So it's starting to get your body comfortable with the touch and knowing, oh, okay, that doesn't hurt there. If there is unwanted pain, we stop. We don't want to push through it um, and then we can revisit that at another point. And over time, the intention is to bring touch um, to the opening of the vagina and then internally. Some people may use things like dilators, hands. Some people might do it with a partner if they want to. So, yeah, I think one approach that I really like to take and my clients really, really enjoy but also see great results from is including masturbation into the process. That's good. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. So start off slow pretty much. It's like, yeah, communication is key. Start off slow. There's it's not a it's not a rush. It's not a race. <laughs> it's not a race. Yeah. It's not a competition. <laughs> it's not a race. Take it slow. We people with chronic illnesses, we want to be we want to feel safe in conclusion, I feel. Totally. Can I just say also with chronic pain, um, I, I've had chronic pain from mm. slip discs and that's something that's really interesting and very different um, because when you have chronic pain in the, your physical, you think sex, you know, it's really uncomfortable because of the positioning and things like that. So what you're saying actually can really help some people who it may not be, um, you know, a reproductive pain um, in your chronicness it could be anything like a chronic shoulder pain leg pain um and 
the really interesting thing is how much an orgasm can help in chronic mm. pain. And, you know, I know that personally. Um, so masturbation is such an important role in that. And if you do have someone that you really trust in that situation, like um, having an orgasm where it's comfortable for you, even though you have an extremely painful back something like being in a bath where you're being um buoyant and you you know you're not being having someone on top of you in mm. bed or um and then bringing it into a partner I think is incredibly important as well so you know um if you are someone that does have chronic pain in other parts of your body please don't rule out orgasms because they are so incredibly helpful for releasing that what is it George endorphins, dopamine, serotonin. Feel good neurochemicals. Mm. Yeah, all the all the things. And that's such a great point, Evie, because um yes, if it regardless of the the chronic pain, like wherever it is in your body, um even a disability, like it pleasure is political sometimes and yeah. not all people feel like they can access their body. Not all people feel like they have a right to experience pleasure if they're sick mm. or if they're going through something yeah. that, that pleasure may not be a priority and pleasure may not be something that they feel comfortable exploring. However, it can be um, a, an incredible remedy to pain and discomfort. Yeah. It can support you in feeling human. It can, it can be a pain relief and as you said there are many different ways like if you can't um, have penetrative sex or you can't lie on your back or you can't do certain things with your hands there are so many incredible tools out there that we're seeing emerging every day like sex tech the industry is exploding and so even if it's like a sex pillow and putting that under your bum while yeah. you have um, you know while you masturbate or even if it's looking at okay we can't have sex together but let's redefine sex to include mutual masturbation or witnessing each other or giving and receiving certain types of touch the more we can expand this definition of what sex is I think the more people will be able to access pleasure and orgasm as a really great way of feeling human my question for you Georgia is um, I'm going I'm in menopause now and mm. I have pretty much no sex drive. Um, I'm completely fine with that. I find that the, the, I still have a tiny amount of sex drive, like it's almost like a build-up where I need a release and I know that, so I do that. Um, and then it takes a really long time to get to that point again. Um, I'm completely fine with it, but I'm single. Um, the question that I have for you is if anyone's listening um, and isn't fine with their sex drive leaving them, because I used to have a an absolutely massive sex drive um, and I'm kind of relieved that it's, it's kind of got away in a way. It took up a lot of my time. Um, but, you know, especially if someone, if people are listening and they're not okay with it or if they're in a relationship and their sex drive is gone but their partner still wants to have a lot mm. of sex, what what do you advise for that? Yeah, so I think that there's so much in this question and I think, Everyone has a story about their sex, their sexual desire changing or um, it not being what it used to or ebbing and flowing. Um, so as you identified, it's not a concern for you and, you know, great, like sex and desire, it doesn't have to be a priority for you to have a fulfilling and healthy relationship with your own body or with other people. And I find that often couples will come to see me and they'll be really concerned and I'll ask them why. Like what does a fulfilling sex life give to your relationship? Is it moments of connection? Is it that you get to feel good? Is it that you feel like you should be having sex because you're married mm. or in a long-term relationship? So I ask, why is sex important to you? And what are you, what do you feel you both or all are currently missing out on by not engaging in sex the amount that you would like to? Um, when we look at desire, many things can have an impact on it. Of course, it can be um, 
hormonal, age, stress, a pandemic, like relational issues and concerns, having a messy house, carrying the mental load. So many things can have an impact on desire. And when I work with people, I really um, want to educate them on what desire is. So often we hear the term sex drive, and this isn't necessarily an accurate way to describe desire because a drive being, you know, the, the drive to live, to survive, a drive to breathe, functions in the body to make sure you stay alive. Desire, if you don't have sex, you're, you're not going to die. Although sometimes for some people it may feel like that. Mm. <laughs> but you you will not die from not having sex. So when we look at desire, um, there are two ways of experiencing it. There's spontaneous desire. And that refers to the spontaneous urge or the spontaneous wanting for sex that seemingly comes out of nowhere. A lot of people identify that when they first start having sex or it when they're in a new relationship, that they're more spontaneous, that it's exciting, it's novel, they can't keep their hands off each other and so on. So some people are familiar with that. But then we have responsive desire, and this is actually way more common, and that refers to how much stimulus your body needs in order to bring sex front of mind. That could be a half an hour massage, it could be someone organising a date for you, it could be Mm. seeing your partner in their element, it could be going away on holiday, Um, It could be, you know, really, really small or really, really big, but it looks at what your body needs in order to bring sex front of mind. And often people are coming to me saying, I've got low libido, but really once we work it out and and educate them on what desire is, they're like, oh, I, I don't have a low libido. I'm just more responsive, but I'm not getting enough stimulus in order to think, oh, this is a great idea or sex would be really wonderful right now. Now. So there are so many practical things. Um, I would never recommend getting libido pills or anything mm, like that. Like good, if, good. yeah, that, that horny goat weed. <laughs> yeah. Piss off. <laughs> I mean, there are so I'm obviously not a a naturopath, but you know, of course, when there are hormonal issues and concerns, that's an individual thing. So you need to go get your bloods done. You need to look at lifestyle. You know, look at all those things. Um, Yeah, I've seen a me and a lot of my colleagues have seen a lot of distressed people coming in saying these libido pills didn't work for me, and now I'm even more broken. So Mm. desire is about context, and it's normal very, very normal and very human that it changes over time. If it is important to you, um, there's a lot that you can do in order to start having more fulfilling sexual experience on your own or with someone else. And it's also okay to not have that desire. Absolutely. Yeah. There's there's no shame Mm. in it as well, if that's you. Yeah. And there's already too much shame when it comes comes to sex. Yeah. Like there is too much thinking about what I should be doing, what I should look like, yeah. what, you know, what's a yes. normal amount. It's like the most common what question. What someone else wants of me. Yeah, totally. That if you are fine or you're going through something or you're just wanting to take a break from sex or you're not receiving the things that you need, take a break. Yeah. It's so normal and so human. All right. All right. So we're going to do some questions that have been provided to us from our listeners. And one of them, which I think is a great question, a lot of them are great questions actually, but this one in particular I wanted to ask you, Georgia, is how do you talk to someone about STIs before sex if you have an STI? Mm. This is a really great question. And I think when it comes to STIs, unfortunately, there still is a lot of shame around um, having shame and stigma. And they are so common, um, so human. They are often a part of sex. um, And, you know, many people are living with them and having wonderful, fulfilling, sexy, liberated, empowering lives. So just, you know, remember that. And I think Mm. the, the first step is to get all the information as to this STI, as to how you can manage it, anything that you need to know, because the more information you have, the more um, knowledge and the easier 
that will be to communicate that to whoever you're having sex with so that they feel empowered with that knowledge too. So do a bit of research, go see a GP, um, a sex positive GP always. Um, I think it's always really important to have the the conversation up front, to let someone know um, that information and to say something along the lines of, hey, I'm currently living with X and these are all of the things that we can do to make sure we are both practicing safer sex. Um, How do you feel about that? Is there anything that you would like to know in order to feel comfortable coming into this? And knowing that sometimes people do have a reaction to a um, mm. so to information like this. And that information for you says a lot about them as well. They may need to go away um, to do their own research and, you know, that's okay. And it may be the opportunity to come back and say, yeah, okay, let's have this kind of sex or let's do this together. Often people do um, speak or respond from a place of fear and that might not actually be how they think and feel. So, um, allowing for that conversation, maybe taking time away to to think about it and then coming back and, yeah, doing everything that you can to uh, make sure that you are as practising as safe as possible. Um, but, yeah, you can have really great sex. And mm. I think if you ever do receive that information from someone, please know that that can feel like a really edgy, scary and uncomfortable thing for them to share. So if you can hold space for them, show them respect, be kind to them. um, And, you know, that that would have or could have felt really big. So doing what you can to, you know, be really gentle and kind with people um, and knowing that, yeah, your sex life will be and can be really great with these open conversations. Yeah, great. It's all about communication, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. you, you totally. have to put yourself in the other person's shoes. You've got to think if you had that STI, how would you want somebody to respond to you and vice versa? It's mm. not, It's not. yeah, I think the stigma thing is such a big one and we're so worried that then they're going to go away and talk about it. But mm. yeah, that says, like you Shame. said, more about yeah. them than it does you having it so that's a big message I feel as well Mm. yeah and they may not be a bad person either they may be just um programmed with with shame exactly and and judgment you know that they have not really thought about well what if that was me in that position exactly totally yeah yeah yeah, it's all about talking (laughs) it It often is which can be hard it can be hard to speak about sex but very hard I Very. honestly think that most concerns can be solved with some great frameworks in how to discuss yeah. sex. So. Yes. Yeah. Mm. yeah. It's yeah. all about learning how to do it. Mm. And so unlearning. It. Yeah. And unlearning. <laughs> oh, and deprogramming. Yeah. <laughs> and we've all, we've we've all, all got, got to do so it. much to learn <laughs> yeah. and keep learning. That I mean, still, the, that's the one thing, um, no matter how old you are, always know that there's still more to mm. learn. Now. Oh. This yeah. brings me to another one. <laughs> now, this is really funny because a couple of uh, maybe maybe two months ago on maths, um, there was a guy talking to one of the, his his wife about what he will and won't do in bed and blah blah blah. And he um, said, you know, it's not like I would be, I don't want to do pegging or anything. And she looked so blank, like she actually said, I don't know what that is. Mm-hmm. And on Twitter that night. <laughs> Uh, Because I'm on Twitter all the time when I watch shows like that. Um, Everyone, there was this one tweet that was retweeted a lot that said, um, the most Google word, the most Googled word tonight is pegging. (laughs) And it was funny because I'm like, do I know what pegging is? Is, I think I know what pegging is. But I found it really interesting that this show was educating people in a way because all of a sudden everyone's talking about pegging. Um, and when you know what pegging is, then the question, I mean, can you please tell us first what pegging is? Yes. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So, um, I guess the definition of pegging is when a cis woman, so, and a person with a vulva wears a strap on and penetrates a cis man, a a person with a penis. Um, so that, you know, uh, when I speak about sex, I really try and steer clear from gender associated with genitals because, you know, you can have any kind of genitals and identify as any kind of gender. But, mm. yeah, it is wearing a strap on and penetrating someone else. And there, 
often this is um, a type of sex that gets people talking. Anytime I speak about anal sex, content literally goes viral. People really? are fascinated. They just want to know about it. And I think when we see um, heterosexual men respond to, I'd never do that, that I'd never take it up the butt, we need to really examine that. If that's not for you and that's a choice and you're not consenting and that's a boundary, wonderful. You should never feel pressured yeah. um, to explore something sexually that you don't want to. However, mm. I think we should also examine this um, the homophobia that is associated with yes. experiencing pleasure through anal penetration. And the anus a- and the rectum is rich with nerve endings. Like people with penises can orgasm without even being erect or even ejaculating but being Mm. penetrated anally and women yes totally Mm. absolutely any anyone can anyone with a butthole yes yeah Yeah. which is pretty (laughs) much everybody (laughs) pretty much everyone um so yeah there is so much pleasure that can be experienced there but because there is um this association that experiencing a type of sex is something about who you are uh, and and your sexuality. Mm. Unfortunately, a lot of people aren't um, experiencing something that they may be curious about. Yeah, and that's a real shame Um, because, you know, a lot of women – are asked to have anal sex Mm. and that doesn't make us gay men. Mm. No. (laughs) So why would it be? Uh, That was actually one of our listener questions as well is why are cis straight men okay with being pegged but not okay with a real dick Mm. being up there? Yeah, and uh, I mean that is... That's a big question. That is about sexuality. Yeah, and that it comes is. down and who's attached to attached to that dick. Exactly. Exactly. Mm, this comes yeah. down to this a lot of what um uh discussions that we'll hear is people saying, I'm not gonna peg my husband. Does that mean he's gay? And yeah. um, of course it doesn't. If the only thing that can say something about your sexuality is you, if you feel comfortable to share that, the only person, the only thing that can say that is you. Um so a type of stimulation, a type of sex that you enjoy says nothing about your identity Mm. unless you want it to. So we need to start challenging these ideas when, um, yeah, someone would feel perhaps really vulnerable asking to try this new thing with you and you come at them with with shame or blame or accusations. Um, Pegging can be really fun for everyone involved and we haven't even spoken about the person wearing the strap on. Like it can be so pleasurable whenever I invite some of my clients who are curious about pegging or wearing strap-ons. they, they practice like putting it on, walking around the house, like thrusting with it, seeing yeah. how it feels to have this appendage yeah. that they don't usually have. And it's fun. Didn't you get Angie to peg you a little bit with a strap <laughs> No, on? that wasn't Georgia. That was what we did BDSM. Yes, yes. <laughs> I did no, see that. No. That was great. <laughs> that was a different, that was a different Angie tries. But I did. I got to put one on and I got to feel what it was like. And you know what? I'd never done it before. And that, that feeling. How did it feel for you? I think I said I liked it, it came with this weird sense of power and I don't know mm. if it was like a conditioned thing with men, you mm. know, cis men are powerful. But mm. instantly that came into like my psyche was, oh, wow, this feels quite powerful. Mm. But then when I was asked to like not actually insert it but like pretend to mm. do it, I got really uncomfortable. Mm. Well, there was a crew, an entire crew around me. Maybe if there wasn't, I might have been like, yeehaw. Yeah. But um. Yeah, it was a really, really different feeling to anything I've ever mm. experienced sexually yeah. before. But I kind of dug it. Mm. I was like, I feel, yeah, I feel powerful. <laughs> yeah, it's <laughs> fun and pleasurable and sexy for, for so many people. So, yeah, if you're curious about it, go get one. Try it on. Yeah. yeah. Thrust with it. Explore it. Yeah. <laughs> you freak flag fly, I yeah. say. No yes. judgment up in here. Go for gold. We got a really gross one, but I don't know if we should talk about it, but it's just oh. really triggering. Oh, okay. But it was like a male ex-friend said he won't date women his age, he's 47, they taste different to 20-year-olds. <laughs> True or false? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All our minds, 
<laughs> oh, gosh, there's just so much about this. I mean, the first thing I want to say is genitals taste like genitals. Yeah, they are God. not meant to be rosebuds. They are not meant to be mm-hmm. strawberry lip gloss. They are genitals. And this, I think, you know, date whoever you want. You're attracted to, you know, whoever you want. So as long as it's legal and consensual. Yeah. But yeah, we really need to change this conversation around yeah. genitals. There are certain things that you can do. And I think lots of people have a responsibility. If you're having sex or you're wanting to receive oral to feel more comfortable for yourself or to allow your partner to have a better experience as well. Many people do opt for a quick shower or a, yeah. um, you know, a body safe genital wipe and that's awesome, great. However, genitals are genitals. Like yeah. we're, we, we can't and we shouldn't expect them to you yeah. know, smell like something specific. It's like a lollipop. They yeah. won't. Mm. And also it's an, an individual age. thing. Yeah. It's yeah. Such What's an age got to thing? do with what mm. your vagina tastes like, whether you're 40, 18, 60? Like what does he think as you get older, your fanny gets more like, <laughs> like, I don't know, There's like sloppy? <laughs> Yeah. And I mean, that it would have so much to do with everything, like just, you know, what you eat or what you, yes. you know, what your hormones are doing at the time. I never forget watching this movie with John Krasinski in it and um, Maya Rudolph. And the very beginning of the movie, um, he was going down on her and he was like, you taste different. And she said, what do you mean? And he goes, there's a different taste. And she was pregnant. Oh, cool. That was, she was like, maybe I should do a pregnancy test or something. And she did. And she, and he was like, I knew it. There was a, something different about you. Yeah. And it wasn't a bad thing. Yeah. He was just like, there's a different mm. taste in that. Yeah. And I thought that was so fascinating. Like, there's a mm. movie that's probably 20 years old. Mm. And I remember it blew my mind because I'm like, wow. We've got so many different factors that make – I remember working about 20 years ago at SeaWorld and a girl telling me that she liked going out with this particular guy because he was a vegan and his cum tasted clean. Yeah. Like it, it didn't have any um, preservatives in or whatever, you know. She was, and I was I remember <laughs> thinking at the time – that's weird. Preservatives in your cum. That's like the um that episode of Sex in the City when Samantha has oh, the yes. funky spunk. Yeah. yeah. Funky spunk. Try a hint of mint. Dear funky spunk, <laughs> try a hint of mint. <laughs> I think it's something That's like right. that. How yeah. long does it take before it gets into <laughs> you? The wig wig shots. Shots. <laughs> shots. <laughs> oh, my God. Sex in the City is so much. It's, I know. Cool. It's so good. Yes. But it's pretty much with this, like, it's like in conclusion, obviously, like your body, what you eat, what you consume, what you've done differently, but there's no such thing as just because you're young, your vagina is going to taste better than somebody that's older. Like, I think that's the main point here, right? It's like age is not, like a 20-year-old vagina doesn't taste better than a (laughs) 40-something-year-old vagina. Like, (laughs) come on, people. It's individual (laughs) vaginas here. It's not like a group of vaginas that taste the same. (laughs) Hashtag not all vaginas. Yeah, <laughs> Not all vulvas, not all vaginas. Not all, not, not all <laughs> exactly. Vulvas. Oh, my goodness. Uh, yeah, well, that was a weird That was a weird question, but um, I love that she put in at my ex-friend, yeah. like she's letting us know I don't talk to him anymore. Yeah, yeah she's like, yeah. see you later. We're not associated. <laughs> he asked me that or told me, told me that yeah. he doesn't date. I mean, imagine yeah. your mate telling yeah. you, I don't date women my own age because they don't taste as good. I mean, you would slap them. <laughs> That's a psyche thing, though. That's a psyche mm. thing where they're like, yeah, twi- like younger means yep. tastier. It's like, no, that's yep. all in your head, dude. Mm. That's in your yep. head. Mm. It's a power thing as well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, brilliant questions. Oh, so we much love goodness. Them. We need to do it again. I know, we need to <laughs> yes. do it again. We've run out of time today and we have so many more questions, mm. but we thank you so much for joining. You're our first guest, you know. <gasps> What? We've never had you. Beautiful. One. Thank you for so, having me. You. you took our first guest virginity. How Yay. fitting. Yay. Sexual debut. How fitting. Yay. And so it didn't fitting. even hurt. Oh, no, it, it did not have, have chronic you. illnesses. And it shouldn't. <laughs> it shouldn't. <laughs> That's right. Only. I felt so safe. We felt like we were really being respected and listened to. <laughs> and you did really, really well with This is the model. You. This is the model. You're the best. <laughs> You're the best. Thank, Thank you Georgia. for joining us. We so love good you. to see you. Thank, Thank you. you.